Hey, beloved. I was sent a wonderful medical journal uh, from a Christian psychiatrist and neurologist, and I'm going to read you about the psychological damage and effects of the false gospel called Lordship Salvation, in which you are told you must submit your life and turn from your sinful ways to receive the free gift, which free means without earning or payment, and gift is free by its very definition. But God draw, you know, bangs it home, free gift. He makes sure you know that you receive it by faith. Again, the gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, that Christ died for our sins, according to scriptures, was buried and rose again on the third day, according to scriptures. Now let's read this, it'll be a little long, it may be two parts. The relationship, this is uh, Dr. Frank Minerth. The relationship between faith and works has been an issue of debate for many years. It centers around the nature of saving faith. Does it entail a response of the human will to the Lordship of Christ? Evangelicals maintain that justification is by grace through faith alone and that works are best understood as the fruit of faith. Now that's the spiritual maturity. Some people remain babes in Christ for a long time if they're not properly discipled. Uh, this faith is the one biblical foundation for assurance of salvation. When one becomes a Christian, he consciously believes in Christ. He does not need, nor is he required, to will a commitment to obedience, though he may do so. Again, scriptural. It's not for him that willeth, because I'm sick of them saying it. No, you just got to be willing. No, it's not for him that willeth or for him that runneth, but of God who showeth mercy. Lordship salvation advocates, <clears throat> oh, advocates have extended saving faith to include a commitment to the Lordship of Christ, which entails obedience. Now, let me just tell you, no one can call Jesus Lord except it be by the Holy Ghost. What does that mean? You can call him Lord with your mouth like those in Matthew 7, 21, who never did the will of the Father, which is simply believing on the Son for eternal life, but they brought their works their many wonderful works to justify them okay now um so if you're not reborn of the spirit sealed with the holy spirit of promise the moment you trust in christ alone for salvation when you believe the gospel and that alone saves you then he's not your lord you can submit your will and all this and do what you think he would want you to do adherence to the law or whatever but you know they're hypocrites those that want you to keep the law they themselves don't keep the law we know that all right this makes assurance conditional and the best anyone can hope for is to have enough good works to be somewhat confident of salvation they believe how many of john piper as soon as i wake up in a sweat wondering am i one of the elect you know why because he doesn't rest in the promise of god and is looking to his works to prove he's saved it's the satanic doctrine of Calvinism that is infiltrated, which is a, 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 the root of it was Roman Catholicism. Uh, they believe that faith is necessary for assurance of salvation, but not sufficient. The whole book of Hebrews is to teach you that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus alone, the one-time sacrifice for all, is sufficient for salvation and they did the willful sin of rejecting the sufficiency of Jesus' sacrificial death and returning to the Levitical law to establish their own righteousness. They also believe that confession, baptism, restitution, uh, by the way, Judas repented and made restitution, returned the money and dropped right into hell because he did not believe. Good works and surrender to Christ's lordship or some other requirement is necessary for salvation. People, this is another gospel, which is not another, it's a curse. All right, number two, the clarity of the gospel message. Salvation is God's free grace gift to each believer. For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If it was about you turning from sins or keeping the law, or whatever, same thing. Uh, you could say, I'm saved because Jesus died and I stopped sinning to the best of my ability. Uh, it was about my willingness. I, you know, bowed the knee in humility so that I could add my works. All right, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Jesus has already paid for it in full. 
the only requirement for receiving forgiveness and eternal life, which is the free gift, by the way, the free gift of eternal life, is to believe on Christ. This is clearly based on Scripture. When it says believe on, it means to put all 100% trust, reliance on his finished work. Okay, it's to believe he accomplished what he said he came to do, and that was to redeem us to the Father. All right, you believe it or you don't, and they don't believe it because they don't simply rest in it. They mock God's power unto salvation that we receive by the foolishness of preaching as easy believism or cheap grace. You know what? It's not cheap. It's absolutely free, but it cost God his son. All right, this is clearly based on Scripture not on personal experience. In about uh, 115 New Testament, 115 New Testament passages, the salvation of a sinner is declared to depend only upon believing, and in about 35 passages, depend on faith, which is a synonym for believing. Any addition to believing is anathema to God, and anathema means cursed or accursed, all right? The divine message is not believe and pray, believe and confess sin. Believe, okay, they're going to use this, uh, if we are confess our sins, we are faithful and just. Okay, that was about people denying original sin and saying there is no such thing for sin. And then John is saying, well, if you confess you're a sinner, because if a man says he has no sin, there's no truth in him, he's deceived himself. So if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you. That doesn't mean that's an ongoing confession. It means you admit and confess you're a sinner and then you can receive the gift of salvation and forgiveness because you've, you've admitted that you're a sinner and need the Savior. Believe and be baptized, believe and repent, or believe and make restitution. These added requirements have appropriate meanings in the scriptures, but if they were essential to salvation, they would never be omitted from any passage where the way to be saved is stated. Do you think God, like, forgot to add something to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved in the one very clear uh, passage what shall I do to be saved and Paul and Silas said believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house because they preached to the entire house it says that so he preached who Christ was God in the flesh who fulfilled scriptures and came in the form uh, of sinful flesh, born to a virgin, who laid his life down, who was buried and rose again, and uh, was buried and rose again for us. So we know that the, the receipt, his, he was received. The sacrifice was received and accepted because he rose. All right, salvation is unconditional, meaning it cannot be earned by merit or denied because of demerit. And the moment one believes, this gift includes redemption, reconciliation, forgiveness, regeneration, that to, means to be born again, justification, that means to be declared innocent and perfect, perfection and glorification. This work of God, we will be glorified, joined to a glorified body. This work of God is so perfect that it lasts forever. I've told you, if you don't believe one saved, always save you don't believe the gospel. John 5, 24 10, 28 through 29, and Romans 8, 1. Christ offered assurance of this when he said, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. John 6, 37. Later he said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. John 10, 27, 28. Now again, they'll say, See, you got to follow him in obedience and submit. No, no. He is the word. What does the word say to do to be saved? You follow the word. That's believing the gospel, okay? Where is the lack of assurance? Where there is a lack of assurance, there's usually an impression that so long as one's daily life is imperfect, it is unreasonable to do any more than hope for God's mercy. No conviction of assurance can grow where the mind is still wondering whether it had really believed in the saving way. This may be a three-part series, people, okay? God saves us in spite of our unworthiness and sins and keeps us saved for all eternity because of the cross. See, when I say, I know I have eternal life. Oh, that's so prideful. Only if you trust in something you're doing is it prideful. I completely rest. I've entered into his rest, ceased from all my works, and I've received eternal life. And they hate me for it. And they'll hate you for it, too. His divine provision calls for no payments to be made on the installment plan. Believers are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 1.13, 4.30, and 2 Corinthians 1.22. 3. Grace versus works and law. 
Under grace, the children of God are delivered from the burden of a covenant of works. They are free. By the way, God already knew no one would ever keep it. It was to stop our mouths, to make us guilty before God, to show us our need for a Savior, and to dissolve any, like, deception in our minds that we could be righteous in ourselves because we are all as an unclean thing and in me and my flesh dwells no good thing they are free to live in the power of the indwelling spirit and are accepted in christ ephesians 1 6 this is in contrast to works romans 11 6 theologically the word works refers to acts of obedience take willpower and labor that's ephesians 2 8 9 and titus 3 5 that's what works are. Repenting of sins isn't a work. Yes, it is, because that's obedient to the law. It's keeping the law. How, are you are you crazy? Repent of your sins. Repent of breaking the law. Keep the law. It's the same thing. Grace is also in contrast to law. In Galatians 5.4, John 1.17, a law implies a regulation that should be kept. I've heard Christian workers say, I tell someone about the Christian life before he becomes a Christian so he'll know what to expect. Okay, just block the kingdom of heaven then instead of telling them the good news. Put a, a yoke around their neck that you won't keep yourself. Their aim is to abstain, <clears throat> obtain from the person a resolution to live the Christian life. You just block the kingdom of heaven. Whoa, to you scribes and Pharisees. You work so hard to make one proselyte, one convert, make him twice the son of hell as yourself. You won't let anybody enter and you won't enter either. The law formula is... If you will do good, I will bless you. Conduct secures favor with God instead of securing favor with God through Christ. See, they don't believe that where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. It's where sin abounds, it diminishes. You get less grace because you messed up. It's silly. All right, now I'm going to give you something here uh, with side by side the difference of grace and works, okay? Now, under grace, salvation is a free gift. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, John 1028 and Romans 623 under law salvation now the law here is if a person could keep it because technically you could be saved by the law if you kept the law from birth till death in all your thoughts and all your words and all your deeds which is impossible Christ is the only one that did it because he did not inherit the fallen Adamic nature he came in the form of sinful flesh his father was the Holy Spirit God the Father all right and under law, salvation would require a payment by the individual. All right? By grace, demerit, something you messed up or sinning, cannot result in salvations being denied. See? Because there's no more condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. There isn't. All our sins were future. They're, 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 they were purged, gone. And he uh, separated us from, from as far as the east is from the west. And under law, demerit can result in denial. Of salvation see you fail once if you if you offend in one point you offend in all as James says so you you having one little sin like a, a wicked thought or a foolish thought can you'll be lost all right now do you understand you cannot bring the law in because the standards are so high and Jesus tried to tell people that they just won't they won't believe him all right under grace personal merit cannot result in salvation you cannot be saved by your works Galatians 5 6 3 22 under law, personal merit can result in salvation if you could do it. All right. Under grace, grace plus nothing is salvation. Galatians 4, 9. Under law, grace plus merit. All right. Uh, under grace, it starts with what Christ has done. Hebrews 7, 16. Under law, it starts with what you are doing or what the individual must do. Under grace, only believe. In Gospels, over 115 times it tell you that. But they will throw out over 100 clear verses on faith alone, believe, 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 and take one vague verse out of context, like faith without works is dead, or can, we are not justified by faith only, but also works. But that's not being justified to God. That's being justified in the eyes of other people, in the eyes of other men because they need to see our works so we're justified in their sight okay he says you show me your faith uh without works and i'll show you mine with works you see that's how we know it's about justification in the eyes of men all right um and under the law it's believe plus lots of things all right under grace it's receive and then do because you know he seals us with the holy spirit of promise the seed of christ is in us and he gives us the desire 
to start walking in his will. Now, sometimes we can fall away if we're not and remain babes in Christ, uh, and then he'll put us back in line. To live. And some you can have gaps there. You can be backslidden or stagnant for many years, but he always finishes the work he began in us, okay? Now, under law, you have to do in order to receive. See, under grace, we receive it already with nothing we did, and then we do it out of love for him and because he gives us the desire and the strength to do it. Under grace, uh, again, we grow in his grace, okay, and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, under grace, contrasted to debt. It can't be grace and works, and he says that, or the reward's no longer reckoned of grace. You've made yourself outside of grace. You have fallen from grace, it says. All right, it's Romans 4, 4, Romans eleven six, 6, and uh, Galatians 5, 14. Under law, it's consistent with debt, works, and law keeping. All right? And this man says, one of my psychiatric patients had been exposed to the grace plus system. See, the one side of my, it's grace through faith, but stop them right there. You're about to get a false, accursed gospel that makes them anathema, accursed. All right? Combined with her own obsessive compulsive personality, she succumbed to disabling guilt frustration and disillusionment i've told you i slit my wrist i don't want anybody else ever doing that because it's not good news to tell you the burden of sin is on you the good news is that christ did it all all right now this woman said i'm going to hell i just know it i haven't done enough right you know have i repented enough what if my heart i didn't have enough heart faith what if it's not your measure of faith honey it's the object of whatever faith you have, even if it's edema as a mustard seed. It's what you put that faith on, okay? And it's on Jesus and his finished work. And uh, so the psychiatrist said, I asked her to picture Christ on the cross, to picture each of her sins driving a spike into his hand, and finally to visualize carrying all of her guilt up to the cross and giving it to Christ. She had an anguished demeanor. I shared John 6.37 and Ephesians 2.8.9 and explained that what we do and don't do in the Christian life is not based on a brownie point system, but on faith in Christ as our Savior. Soon, a serene, peaceful look came over her face. I had introduced her to grace. And that's the glorious gospel, people. How can they say this is good news? It's crazy that they say that. All right, I'm going to finish this little bit up here. Uh, and then we're going to do a part two, the fallacies of Lordship's theology. The significant fallacies of Lordship salvation include the following. One, people are being asked to earn God's love and acceptance by resolutions leading to consistent good works. That's why, like my friend R.L. says, he, he was an atheist because of Billy Graham, because it was all what God demanded. Okay, we're born a sinner. It's our very nature, but God demands we stop being the very thing that we are. See, they, they, they give you another gospel, another Jesus, and they have another spirit. People cannot accomplish this, nor is it necessary, praise God. No believer glorifies God in all that he or she does all the time. 1 Corinthians 3.11, the one, the one law should have stopped their mouths to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, body, everything. Nobody does that all the time. That should have shut them up and said, no, nope, we can't do that. But they, they were self-righteous. They, they didn't believe it. All they command we can do. All right. Salvation is a work of God for man. Let me say that again. Salvation is a work of God for man, not a work of man for God. Okay? Salvation, discipleship. Good works grow out of a saved life, but do not precede salvation or form any basis for it. Now, they should grow out of a saved life. Some people remain babes in Christ and never spiritually mature. That's why the apostles give us all those instructions to have the milk of the word, to be in fellowship, to put on the robe of righteousness, all of that. Okay? Number two, people are often asked to make Christ the Lord of their life. Again, no one can call Jesus Lord except it be by the Holy Ghost, okay? And you don't make him anything. He is Lord of all. Whether you understand that or not is a different story. This implies that acknowledging Christ's lordship is a human work, but it is not man who makes Christ Lord. That's who he already is. He is our Lord, creator, savior, and friend. 
By believing in him, he already lives in us in the person of the Holy Spirit, whose purpose is to glorify Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, John 15, 5. That's why I say the Holy Spirit doesn't convict you of sin. That's your conscience. The Holy Spirit convicts a saved person of righteousness, of their right standing with God because of what Christ did. You see? All right. As to, it says in Hebrews that having had all their sins purged once and for all, they should have no more consciousness of sin. All right? It's the evil conscience. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, not the tree of life, which is Christ. All right. As children of God, believers can enjoy a day-to-day -day witness of the Holy Spirit and experience of inward transformation. We simply get up and wake up that day and just let him lead us through that. We don't need to have bondage on us. It's ridiculous. They just don't trust God's way. They just don't believe him. Their natural minds can't receive it. All right, our own human resources and merits are in no way related to this experience of divine grace. Number three, requiring a daily commitment to make Christ the Lord of one's life is asking unregenerate people to make a promise they can in no way keep. They don't even know what sin they have. It's so deep. They're going to fix the outward flesh ones. I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to stop. But their hearts remain wicked. You can see that in those who stalk me and hate me murder in their hearts but they think because they stopped their drinking or whatever their porn that you know they're righteous now mm, 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 deception is crazy uh this law as well as <clears throat> those who try to keep it are doomed to fail because they depend on the very flesh from which deliverance is sought romans 6 14 see when we get the holy spirit we do walk out of the Spirit because the Spirit's the only thing alive. Our flesh was crucified. But a person that doesn't have the Spirit of God dwelling in them, they can't walk after the Spirit because their spirit's dead. The flesh is the only thing technically living and it's driving them. All right? <clears throat> we cannot live to the glory of God by following certain rules on a consistent basis. The will of God is fulfilled in the believer, not by the believer. Let me say that again. The will of God is fulfilled in us, not by us. Do you understand? That's why we must be in Christ. God fulfills it in us. Because he fulfills the law and lives in us, we fulfill it by proxy. Do you see that? Because the one that fulfilled it is in us. Romans 8, 4. No life would ever be good enough to merit anything but condemnation from God if judged on the grounds of moral equity. I said workers of inequity means to be unequal with God's perfection. Again, in Matthew 7, 21, I will not stop saying this in context. They were workers of inequity, unequal with God's righteousness because they never got imputed righteousness. God's righteousness imputed on them by faith, by doing the will of the Father to believe on the Son, to simply trust in Christ. I've given you the scriptures for what the will of the Father is. Those people relied on their many wonderful works. Now, when they say practicer of lawlessness, technically you can say that because all they did, even their so-called good works, were lawless because they were outside of God in them. Do you understand? It wasn't Christ living in them, so their, their, their good works, their preaching, casting out demons, and many wonderful works were iniquity. Because they weren't done by Christ living in us. And in ourselves dwells no good thing. We are all as an unclean thing. Even trying to live a perfect life would produce hopeless discouragement. Oh, man, I get so many people wanting to kill themselves. It makes me so sad. I praise God many of them are getting saved or getting secure and they're coming out of it. Oh, man, I'm so grateful. Realizing our standing in Christ, however, should not lead to laxity in our daily lives. This wonderful position, because we're alive in Christ now, is the strongest possible incentive to pure living that we can know. Again, the strength of sin is not grace. The strength of sin is the law. John 6, 28 says, What shall we do that we might work the works, plural, of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work, singular, of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. Thank you. Four. All people have something in their life that does not allow them to reach perfection. It's funny how they'll pick out your pet sin because it's not their sin. So they're going to tell you, you've got to get rid of that flesh habit. But they themselves have something they eat, they eat too much or they have, you know, caffeine because that harms the immune system. You're harming the body. The body's a temple, you know. They'll never tell you to quit drinking coffee, though, because then that would mean they'd have to look at what they are lacking. Okay. 
How much submission to Christ's lordship will it take to be assured of salvation? See, it's all about what you do. How much is enough? All of us have failed him many, many times. We sinned before we became Christians and have continued sinning ever since. God tells us if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth isn't in it. It's 1 John 1 8. And by the way, that verse in John 1, born of God, cannot commit sin. That means cannot commit even one single sin. And we all know we sin. So what does that mean? It means the new man, the new spirit, the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, the seed of Christ. That one is sinless. That's the new spirit that will be joined to a glorified body. And then we will lose this ego and this mind and this, this soul and be perfected and we shall be like him. Okay? That's what that means. It has nothing. And the new versions put, won't keep on sinning. See how they make it about the flesh? This person that can't sin has nothing to do with your flesh. That, that flesh was crucified. It was died. It was buried. And it rose again with Christ. And we have a new spirit because we died and rose again with Christ. Ugh, it drives me crazy they don't get that. It's a spiritual thing and natural mind can't perceive it. Some people fear that they do not believe enough. Again, I told you it's not the measure of your faith or how much faith, but the object you're placing your small little bit of faith. Only a mustard seed is sufficient. This, the bit of faith you have, all of it, 100%, must be on what Jesus did alone. Okay? A man who came to Jesus once said, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Mark 9, 24. Jesus' response demonstrates that it is not the amount of faith, but the object of faith that matters. The most feeble belief in Christ saved, and the strongest faith in self leaves one lacking. It is Christ who saved us. Belief is the tool we use to receive that salvation. That's why I say it. The faith is the uh, vehicle by which we receive it. Others fear they're not committed enough. No one has ever been totally committed to anything, nor has anyone totally committed every area of his life to Christ. That's the lies in hypocrisy they teach. Subverting your souls with good words and fair speeches. Titus 3.5 reminds us that salvation is apart from any deeds we do, not by works of righteousness we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. What about repenting enough? God never intended for repentance to be a separate work apart from his simple plan of salvation. It occurs simultaneously with, with belief as one turns away from self to Christ for salvation. What have I told you? If you believe, you have repented. See, that's the danger of adding to God's word. Putting of your sins after repentance. When Peter says repent and believe the gospel, it's not repent of your sins and believe the gospel, you see. Repentance literally means a change of thought or attitude with respect to sin, self, and Christ. The believer realizes he is a hopeless sinner and that Christ can save him. Okay, I've done a video on just repentance and went through every verse where we're told to repent and what they're repenting of. Okay, many people may also fear they're not praying enough. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of sound mind. If you're on fear, perfect love casts out fear. See, we are in his perfect love when we simply trust the Savior, people. Just trust him. They don't trust him. They seem right to man, but the end thereof is destruction. And they don't understand scriptures. They can't see grace anywhere. They see law and fear and condemnation because they are unlearned, unstable, rest the scriptures to their own destruction. They are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why? Because if the gospel be hid, it be hid to them that are lost. And the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. They might slap the cross on top of their self-righteousness, but they, they just cannot understand faith alone for some reason. 2 Timothy 1.7. See also Romans 8, 26 and 27. Prayer is only possible through a relationship with God through Christ. This relationship is established by placing faith in Christ. Prayer consists of praise, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. But it is not a requirement for salvation. The key term in scripture is to trust Christ, not to pray about it. I mean, of course we want to pray, but sinner's prayer doesn't save anybody. It's not you saying, I promise not to sin. I turn from my sins and I make you my Lord and save. None of that saves you. Come on. It's the divine. You're not saved by some promise to change your life. All right. It's simply believing on Christ and receiving the gift of salvation. It is the divine purpose that a Christian's conduct should be inspired by the fact that he or she is already saved. Thank you. You were saved in the foundation of the world. You just got to receive it and blessed with all the riches of grace in Christ Jesus, rather than by the hope of an attempted imitation of the Christian standard of conduct will result in salvation. Come on. 
God will reward faithful service, but does not demand it. Our service is an expression of our love for him. But we're not saved because we love him. We're saved because he first loved us. This is the end of part one. I will continue with the double bind message in just a moment. Okay? God bless.